I think it does seem to leave people with some appropriately troubling or even distressing uh, questions. When taken at face value, the ending to Oppenheimer gives us a final glimpse into the tormented mind of the father of the nuclear bomb, revealing a dreadful vision of humanity having opened a Pandora's box that can never be closed again, that has set in motion, as he says to Einstein, a chain reaction that will destroy the entire world. It's an old, defining fear that has been dormant in recent years, but it has never really gone away, has it? Bilgi Ibiri wonders in his review of the movie. Recent events in Russia and Ukraine have served as grisly reminders that we all remain just a hair trigger away from incinerating ourselves in a nuclear holocaust. However, as Ibiri also points out, Nolan doesn't like being didactic. He doesn't like resolving his stories with one clear, simple message. Because the interesting thing about the story, the dramatic thing about the story, is there are no easy answers. Instead, he wanted Oppenheimer's ending to leave us with, as Nolan himself put it, a strong set of troubling reverberations that would land differently with each individual watching the film. And given how I, like many others, haven't stopped thinking about the movie since it came out, I think it's fair to say that he succeeded, that there are some deeper meanings here that resonate far beyond the movie's immediate subject matter. And today, I want to find out what they are. This video is brought to you by Mubi. Go to mubi.com slash like stories of old for an extended free trial. I think the first thing you have to understand to get at the heart of Oppenheimer is that for the first time in years, Nolan has made a genuine tragedy. Unlike Tenet, Dunkirk, Interstellar, Inception and the Dark Knight movies, there's no heroic triumph here, only a tragic downfall. In this sense, we are better off comparing Oppenheimer to Nolan's earlier works, such as The Prestige, Insomnia, and, most importantly, Memento. I'm not a killer. I'm just someone who wanted to make things right. Memento is especially relevant here because it has a very similar structure as Oppenheimer. And this reveals the second thing that is important for understanding the movie's ending, which is its place within the larger structure of the story. In Memento, we were presented with two timelines, one that starts at the very end of the story and that plays out in reverse chronological order, and one that unfolds regularly from the earliest point in the story. These timelines continuously intercut and inform each other until they ultimately converge in the middle, which to us is the end of the movie. Oppenheimer essentially pulls the same trick. Although its narrative structure is arguably even more complicated than Memento's, if we strip it down to its absolute essence, there are also two converging timelines here. One that follows Oppenheimer's life up until the Trinity test in 1945, and one that begins with Strauss's Senate confirmation hearing in 1959 and that sort of looks backwards to cover everything that happens after Oppenheimer creates the bomb. The point of convergence for both of these stories is a conversation between Oppenheimer and Einstein that took place in 1947, which is hinted at throughout the movie but which we don't fully get to see until the very end. And the reason this structural context matters is because, going back to Memento, it's in this climax, or chronologically speaking, in this middle section of the story, that we find a key revelation that not only ties the two storylines together, but that also gives us a pivotal insight into our main character. Do I lie to myself to be happy? Yes, I will. And this is exactly what the ending to Oppenheimer offers us from a narrative point of view. It gives us one last insight into Oppenheimer's mind that helps us to understand both the true outcome of the first timeline, of everything that happened before the Trinity test, as well as the motivation that has been the true driving force of everything that came after. Well, we all know what happened later. So, what exactly do we learn here? Well again, there's the most obvious layer in which Oppenheimer expresses his belief that he has set in motion a chain reaction that will eventually destroy the entire world, which does seem like the logical outcome of his reckoning with the actual consequences of having made the atomic bomb, and which also serves as a valid character motivation for his actions in the chronologically second half of the story in which he seems to almost willingly submit himself to his Promethean torture in a somewhat ambiguous plea for some kind of redemption or reconciliation. 
but I think we can dig a little deeper than this. Because besides giving us character motivation, I believe the real reason why this ending is so impactful is because it also captures a fundamental turning point for Oppenheimer's entire worldview. And I think it's this revelation that truly contains the troubling reverberations that Nolan spoke of. That deeper sense of dread that pierced right through the audience. And that struck so many, including myself, on what felt like an unsettlingly intimate level. We imagine a future, and our imaginings horrify us. But first, some important contextual understanding. As film critic Darren Mooney wrote in his review of Oppenheimer, before the atomic age, the universe was understood through Newtonian physics. In this paradigm, as he explains, there were clear causalities, certainties. It suggested that our universe was logical and deterministic, and therefore that it was knowable, understandable. But then quantum physics came around and basically replaced these certainties with the concept of probability, with the idea that there are aspects of our world that are not knowable that cannot be quantified. It was a time of radical reinvention of the way in which we describe the universe around us, the way in which we understand the universe. As Oppenheimer shows us, it's a transition that scared off the old guard, including Einstein, but it excited a new generation, including Oppenheimer. Before his eyes were filled with that hollow anguish, they were hungry, entranced by visions of a hidden world and by the idea of unknown driving forces beneath our reality and even our own consciousness. For the quantum revolution wasn't limited to physics, it was a reflection, as Mooney writes, of a much larger shift in human understanding, playing out in art, culture, music, politics and psychology. I didn't want to try and explain that to the audience, but the idea is we want to see how radical this thinking was. Indeed, this was the age where Freud and Jung were mapping out the subconscious, the unknown hidden world within our own psyche that shapes our identity through forces we cannot directly perceive. Which of course is another subject that Nolan has always been deeply fascinated by. Needless to say, for a scientist like Oppenheimer, it was a time of excitement and of promise. The promise of pioneering into a new world and domesticating it under the dominion of human civilization. And this is the dominant perspective in the first half of the story. Again, that is the chronological first half of the story. It's the tale of a young scientist on the rise, becoming one of the leading experts in his field, and then getting to combine his two great passions, physics and New Mexico, into the greatest project of his time. One that was going to create a devastating weapon of mass destruction, yes, but also one that, in Oppenheimer's mind, would bring about a lasting peace unlike any we had seen before. One that would in many ways unite the world in a global scientific endeavor and usher in a new era of human progress. Our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. It is easy to point out Oppenheimer's naivety on this matter, but at the same time it is also understandable given how everything leading up to the Trinity test had made him increasingly confident consciously as well as unconsciously, that the quantum world was not just controllable, but that it was his to control, that he was the great man, the father of not just the bomb, but of the nuclear age in its entirety. But then the test happens, and everything changes. That's such an incredible turn in the movie, you know, he's, at, you know, up until that point, he's in full control of everything. He is, he's in charge, he's in demand, he's telling people what to do. And then as soon as the, they, they make the bomb, they take it away from him and he realizes there's no need for me anymore. By now it has become a common trope for Nolan's characters. That inevitable reckoning between grandiosity and reality. The realization that the forces they thought they understood, that they thought they could control, are actually controlling them, leaving them imprisoned in self-made contraptions. It's Nolan's oldest fear, author Tom Schoen remarks, that of being locked in, specifically of locking yourself in, willingly submitting to structures designed to protect you that turn out, instead, to entrap you. Security turns into anarchy, ambition becomes obsession, order breaks down into an all-devouring chaos. What well, hasn't good come of your obsessions? At first, but I followed them too long. I am their slave. And one day they will choose to destroy me. 
and so too it goes for Oppenheimer, as he finds himself increasingly excluded from his own work, increasingly struggling to make sense of the suddenly unfamiliar world around him, as well as of the suddenly unfamiliar world within, where once everything was, like the structure of the Manhattan Project, neatly compartmentalized, work, family, affairs, where once theory could be separated from application, noble intentions from actual outcomes. Now, all boundaries are breaking down, engulfing everything in an unstoppable fire. Instead of mastering the quantum world, Oppenheimer has unleashed it, onto the world and onto himself, and in that process, he has doomed both. As Bilgi Abiri points out, the wondrous visions of secret worlds hidden in the raindrops have been completely replaced by apocalyptic nightmares of horror and devastation. Instead of envisioning the astonishing connections between all matter and even all human relations, Oppenheimer now only sees total annihilation. In his mind at least, he has destroyed the world. He has destroyed his world, his very conception of reality. Fission and fusion, film critic David Ehrlich adds. Nolan has never come up with a cleaner way of framing the chemical reaction that galvanizes so many of his films. Indeed, Nolan's frequent employment of non-linear storytelling doesn't merely bend time or play around with its causal direction. It often serves to break it entirely. His stories fragment themselves like atoms splitting apart and spiraling out of control until the disparate pieces start slamming into each other again in destructive combustions and symphonic revelations that let us experience all at once, past, present and future. It makes, as Ehrlich puts it, discovery inextricable from devastation, creation inextricable from destruction and the innocent joy of theory inextricable from the unfathomable horror of practice. This, perhaps, is the true source of Oppenheimer's ruin. He shattered his reality, and in doing so, he cast himself adrift, unstuck in time, without any hope of reclaiming the blissful certainties he once enjoyed. For as he recounts his days of youthful exuberance, the year is actually 1954, and he already knows exactly where his ambition will lead him. Though at the time he didn't see it, his fate had already been written in the raindrops, Ehrlich continues, leaving Oppenheimer skipping along the surface with a dispassionate remove that can't help but recall the similarly detached Dr. Manhattan. I tell her I still want her, and that I always will. As I lie to her, it is September 4th, 1970. I am in a room full of people wearing disguises. There is a particular tragedy to this disconnection from the linear flow of time, one that was also there in Memento. Because as Leonard willfully sets himself on the self-destructive path that we've already seen him go down, we realize that even though the ending offers a revelation, it doesn't give us a resolution. Instead, a loop is created that sends us right back to the beginning, where Leonard will once again embark on the exact same journey. But whereas Leonard's memory condition left him oblivious to the cruel fate he trapped himself in, Oppenheimer knows full well that he is stuck in an endless cycle. He can see clearly the chain reaction he set into motion, the inescapable prison that he built around himself, and that he is now reliving over and over. Every time, he will rebuild his world, experience his youth, his passion, his hope, and every time, he will burn it all down again, and despair in the ashes. Prometheus chained to a rock, and tortured for eternity. Moving deeper into the subtext, there is an unsettling relatability here that goes beyond the terror of nuclear annihilation. Remember, Nolan wanted to invoke troubling reverberations that would land differently with each individual watching the film, meaning that while Oppenheimer certainly isn't a direct allegory for other issues, it does have symbolical applicability that allowed its ending to pierce right into some broader existential fears that have been haunting our collective psyche. 
Because again, the quantum revolution in physics was but one part of a greater transition in our modern society that, as we have now come to realize, have opened us up to new dangers and vulnerabilities. For besides having meddled with the fabric of reality, we've also been altering the chemistry of our entire atmosphere, affecting macro processes that take place within spatial and temporal dimensions so vast that we can hardly perceive them. We've been interconnecting ourselves over the entire globe, physically as well as digitally, embedding ourselves within increasingly complex and fragile systems. And just as Oppenheimer, we too are now increasingly facing the consequences of these achievements. I think it is fair to say that everyone, in some way or another, is aware of this. That everyone has felt the uncertainty of what all these developments really mean. The dread of where they might be taking us. And the frustration of trying to figure out our own relation to them. Because are we not, at the end of the day, allowing all this to happen? Are we not part of the same all-devouring machine as the scientists at Los Alamos were? Are we not also just playing along, pretending everything will be fine, while deep down we've long since come to realize that it won't? But then again, what can we do? Was Oppenheimer ever really in a position to change things? Wouldn't the bomb have been created with or without him? What becomes of individual agency when we realize that we have fallen into a giant machine that is not ours to control? And that now makes us question if it ever was. If we ever had any real agency to begin with. Because can the powers that shaped the course of our history truly be traced back to deliberate intentions and human ingenuity? To great men and great deeds and the active engagement with human progress? Or has the real power been hiding in the shadows? Secretly directing our fate through an escalating chain reaction of silly coincidences, petty motivations and dumb luck. A man goes on a honeymoon and years later, he saves an entire city from annihilation while destroying two others. Another man sparks a decade-long vendetta, all based on a simple misinterpretation. Do we actively write our history, or does it just happen to us? And if so, what becomes of us then? If we cannot meaningfully alter the system we're so intrinsically a part of, can we carve out an island for ourselves? Can we find scapegoats to take away our own inner turmoil? Other individuals who we can blame so we can imagine ourselves unburdened, unconflicted? Or do we become martyrs ourselves? Do we cast ourselves on the rock to allow for our own torture? After all, punishment is followed by redemption, right? A pat on the back, and all is forgiven. Is this how we justify our lives? As Oppenheimer so painfully emphasizes, by having stolen fire from the gods, by having meddled with forces far greater than ourselves, it feels like we have broken our fundamental concept of reality. And in doing so, we have found ourselves increasingly displaced, struggling for understanding, for certainty, for some kind of reconciliation or absolution. And this, as Darren Mooney concludes, is the bleak and lingering question hanging over Oppenheimer. How can humanity be expected to understand the existential dangers threatening its survival when it cannot even understand itself? Nolan is far from the only filmmaker to have dabbled with themes of apocalyptic dread and existential despair. A while back I made a video titled The Apocalyptic Filmmaker That Haunts My Soul, which is about Bela Tarr, one of my favorite directors of all time. His magnus opus, the almost seven and a half hour long Satan Tango, stands among the greatest achievements in cinematic history. As a movie, it's a bleak yet beautiful odyssey into a desolate world defined by Nietzschean philosophy, false prophets, and a struggle for meaning. As an experience, however, especially if you watch it, as I did, entirely in one sitting, it is quite simply indescribable. It's truly one of those movies you have to have seen at least once. And it is now available on MUBI. MUBI is a curated online cinema streaming hand-picked exceptional films from around the globe. They have an amazing library and offer really useful tools to help you navigate it. There are plenty of curated series that categorize films based on for example a shared theme, era or director. 
Plus, for each individual movie there is a brief explanation about what it offers and what makes it stand out. And so, whether you're new to cinema or a seasoned veteran, there really is no better way to explore the riches of cinema. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days by using my personal link, that's mubi.com slash likestoriesofold, which you can also find in the description below. So be sure to claim your extended free trial to start your free month of great cinema today.